I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution. And I have a secret to tell you, that this is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. What an exciting month of June it is. Uh, the month of June, of course, is constitutional ground zero because it's the month that the Supreme Court hands down a constitutional drumbeat of decisions leading up to historic opinions at the end of the month involving the future of the Affordable Care Act and same-sex marriage. And every week, we are hosting our great We the People podcasts, which review the decisions of the week and summon the top liberal and conservative scholars to give the best arguments on all sides of these constitutional questions. Uh, next Tuesday in New York City, uh, at the University Club, we are sponsoring the latest in our series of traveling town hall debates co-sponsored by the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society. And we will have General Michael Mukasey, the former Attorney General, debating Deborah Perlstein of Cardozo Law School about whether or not NSA surveillance is unconstitutional. We think that these spectacular bipartisan debates, like the Lincoln-Douglas debates, will transform constitutional discourse in America. And then we've got a great series of uh, panels coming up at the Constitution Center in June, including on June 18th, the historian David Sahat, Do the Founding Fathers Have All the Answers? And our Supreme Court review on July 8th with Erwin Chemerinsky and Fred Lawrence. We've also opened a new exhibit downstairs, which I hope you'll see after the show, Speaking Out for Equality, the Constitution, Gay Rights, and the Supreme Court. This is the first exhibit in America that reviews the constitutional evolution of gay rights in the courts, and it uh, is opening just before the Supreme Court is about to hand down its decision. So every, all is well here in constitutional heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Michael Stokes Paulson and Luke Paulson for a conversation about their new book, The Constitution, an Introduction, moderated by Michael Moreland. And this is an exciting uh, book and event on several counts. Uh, first of all, uh, Professor Paulson and Luke Paulson are a father and son team. Uh, the first, I think, bless you, the first father and son uh, uh, scholars writing about the Constitution that I'm aware of, although perhaps uh, th they will come up with other historic examples in the course of their discussion. And they're also the, uh, one of the few scholars to have elicited a rave review from Justice Samuel Alito, uh, who said the following about this book um, uh, recently. Justice Alito says, a new book by Michael Stokes Paulson, a distinguished constitutional scholar, and his son Luke, a recent college graduate, fits the bill. Uh, it provides a solid, intelligent, reliable, and interesting look at the origin of the Constitution, its basic structure, and its interpretation over the course of our country's history. Professor Paulson and his son began this collaboration when Luke was in high school and continued through his college years at Princeton. It's easy to imagine this process as a conversation between a father who's been immersed in the study of the Constitution for his entire adult life, and a bright son who brings a new perspective and challenges the father to explain and defend. So what a great collaboration and how exciting it will be for you to hear about it. Let me now introduce them briefly. Michael Stokes Paulson is Distinguished University Chair and Professor at the University of St. Thomas School of Law. He's a graduate of Yale Law School, and he joined the Department of Justice in the Criminal Division's Honors Program. He's also worked as an Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel, the best constitutional job in government, the office that advises the President on constitutional issues. And Luke Paulson is a graduate of Princeton University, where he majored in computer science with minors in classics and the humanities. What a great combination. He is currently working as a software engineer in Mountain View, California, which is definitely the place to be a software engineer. And our moderator is extremely distinguished. I'm thrilled to welcome him to the Constitution Center for uh, the first time. He joined the uh, Villanova Law Faculty in 2006 and became vice dean in 2012. He is focused on torts, bioethics, and law and religion. He's a former clerk for the Honorable Paul J. Kelly of the US Court of Appeals for the 10th Circuit and served as Associate Director for Domestic Policy at the White House under President George W. Bush. Ladies and gentlemen, pre please join me in welcoming the Paulsons.
Well, welcome to everyone. It's an honor to be here at the National Constitution Center uh, discussing this important and interesting new book by the father and son Paulson teams. One thing that we have in common is we're all Minnesotans. Uh, and although we're talking about the Constitution, which was uh, deliberated just a few yards from here, Minnesota wasn't even a state uh, at that time. So uh, Mike and Luke, talk a little bit about how you came to write the book together and what, what the audience is. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll go ahead and start since I'm, I'm probably the guy that started it. I was out at an academic conference um, here out east and in, after the conference, all the law professors and college professors get together and they have a dinner and around about the second bottle of wine, <laughs> an argument broke out between the college professors and the law professors about when students developed the, they're totally misshapen ideas about the Constitution. And the law professors were blaming the college professors. Why did, what did you do to them? You know, how did they get all these? The college professors said, it wasn't our fault, right? They came to us this way. It's sort of deep in the culture. It's the way civics is taught in high school. It's the media and all that. And I spoke up foolishly and said, well, somebody really ought to write a book that's not aimed at professor types. Right? but that's aimed at real people and students. It tries to set stories straight and provides as clear and objective and lively and readable uh, an account of the Constitution uh, as can be. And they said, well, why don't you write that instead of writing all your boring law review articles? <laughs> so actually, it started right here. The, the, uh, I was at Princeton, and I was flying in and out of the Philly out airport, and I got bumped for my flight, and I had three hours with nothing to do, so I sketched, you know, what would a book that was like just trying to lay it straight and give all the basics of the Constitution in, in like 10 chapters look like? And I wrote it at a coffee shop in the Philadelphia airport, and called home, because I think Luke had to be then in charge of his little sister, since I would be late when she came home, meet, meet her off the, uh, the school bus and everything like that. And that night, I, told, I showed Luke the little two pages of legal pad. And we came up with this idea, he was 13 at the time, um, uh, that it would be a summer job for him to be sort of an informal research assistant. And he had great ideas right away about how to make the book more interesting, to make it tell a story, um, to tell the stories of many of the personalities and characters who were involved in the formation of the Constitution and some of the signal constitutional disputes. And by the end of the night, you know, this was, sounded like a better summer job than lawn mowing or flipping burgers, right? And we made a deal that we would try to write a book together. And we thought we'd do it in one summer. It took nine, <laughs> but we ended up doing it over the course of nine years as this fun, evolving, father-son, summers only vacation project that we did on the side in between camping trips and Luke learning to drive and things like that. And the book took shape over the course of those nine years, sort of unhurried, and it became, we, we think, much more sophisticated over time. It, 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 it was still trying to aim at general readers, at all readers. Um, and I, the tension we had was I would always push for a necessary level of sophistication and depth and detail. And Luke would rein me in if I ever started to suffer from professor-itis, saying too much or getting too jargonistic or too legalistic. And so the, the at a, say, high school audience for this book. Um, for example, high school government courses, uh, so that, as you said, students could go into college and maybe eventually law school with better foundational ideas about the Constitution. And I was the one who was in high school at the time, and I've had good experiences with my civics courses, but I was maybe not satisfied with how they were treating the Constitution. And so I was the one pushing for making it uh, readable and accessible to any one high school level and up. Mm -hmm. Though we, by the time we were done, it was no, it's no longer textbooky. I mean, it could be used in college courses or in high school courses, um, but the idea is that it's a sort of book that uh, 
that if you wanted one book that was your entry into the Constitution, that this would be a good place to start uh, for everyone. You know, we, we think we achieved the necessary level of, of sophistication, um, but we kept the whole time pushing for clarity and simplicity and readability. That, that someone would actually pick up the book and read it. A friend, a friend of mine said, well, how long is this book? And I said, well, it's just over 300 pages, so it's reasonably short. And he said, short? <laughs> Can you say that much about the Constitution for 300 pages? And I said, I said well, look, people write massive treatises, and you know, the Supreme Court seems to sp uh, uh, churn out thousands of pages of opinions every year. 300 pages, believe me, is short. That's something that people can actually get inside of and get their heads around. And it's a lot of, it's a long period of constitutional history to cover in 300 pages. So you know, what, what we tried to do was produce a book that's reasonably comprehensive. It starts with the Constitutional Convention, it starts here in Philadelphia, and then it proceeds through describing the Constitution's basic structure and its features, and then the powers of the various branches of government goes from there to a discussion of slavery uh, and how uh, slavery was accommodated and in some ways furthered by the Constitution. And then we rapidly go to the Bill of Rights. But that's the first five chapters. The Bill of Rights sort of completes, we think, the beginning of the Constitution. The Bill of Rights is kind of a second Constitution, or you could think of it as halftime, right? It's the second half of the, con of the original Constitution completed the project. And then the last five chapters cover the history of the document's interpretation from 1789 to 2014, 2015, running through a series of controversies. And so we cover about 228 years worth of what we think is the most important thing. So uh, <clears throat> it really isn't a textbook. And we really hope it reads, at least for people who are interested in the Constitution, like a novel about the Constitution, it tells a story about the Constitution. We, we hope it has you know, all the basics, that it's Constitution 101, but it's a course that people would actually really want to take. You should buy a copy and take it to the breach room. <laughs> take, take, the, take the book to the beach and everyone will think, wow, you're a, a super intellectual. <laughs> Say, well, I just want to know something about the Constitution. The yeah, and I was interested in making it not a textbook, too. I'd read plenty of textbooks. <laughs> but yeah, we, we spent a while getting it into the, the shape that it's in today. We went through maybe five or six passes of editing even before it got to the publisher. The book does have some very interesting and provocative arguments. And one of them pertains to one of the most famous constitutional decisions, Marbury versus Madison. Uh, from 1803, and, and relatedly, the view that you discuss that, that every branch of government has a role to play in constitutional interpretation. Say, say a little bit about that. Do you want to start or? Oh, oh, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Marbury versus Madison is, it's actually, I think, Mark Twain's definition of a classic, a case that everybody praises, but nobody actually reads. Um, <laughs> Uh, Marbury is this fascinating case that arose in this particular circumstance involving the midnight judges' appointments by John Adams as he's rushing out the door after having been defeated by Thomas Jefferson in the election of 1800. And they failed to deliver the judicial commissions to some of the officers. And it's actually a lawsuit for somebody to get his judgeship. And they bring it straight to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court uses it as the occasion uh, to advance what's referred to as the doctrine of judicial review. And a lot of mythology has grown up around Marbury, saying, like, we, will, we actually read, I think, once in Luke's uh, textbooks, you know, that in 1803, the Supreme Court created the doctrine of judicial review. Well, they didn't create it. It was actually a well-recognized constitutional principle. Um, it had been defended by Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist Papers back in 1788. And it was very current that if the Constitution, the fundamental law of the nation, says one thing, and an act of Congress says something to the contrary, the Constitution wins. It's really a basic principle that the Constitution is supreme law of the land, 
and anything done by Congress, anything done by the President, anything done by the courts that is contrary to the Constitution is unconstitutional and should be void. Now, part of the mythology that's grown up around Marbury versus Madison is that the Supreme Court not only invented the doctrine, which isn't true, but they proclaimed themselves to be the supreme interpreters of the Constitution. Now, nothing at all like that actually happened in Marbury versus Madison. The Supreme Court eventually got around to declaring itself the supreme branch, but it actually didn't happen, we, we trace the history, until 1958, okay? Uh, just a little bit before most of our lifetimes. I was born in 1959, so I missed the great event in 1958. But it wasn't 1803. The original vision of Mad Marbury versus Madison was constitutional supremacy. The Constitution beats anything that government does that's contrary to the Constitution. And if you think about it, that means that anything that the courts do that's contrary to the Constitution is unconstitutional too. So actually, the system that the framers devised was one where no one branch has the power of constitutional interpretation. Rather, as a function of the separation of powers, each branch serves to try as a check on the misinterpretations of the others. The framers vision was not a Supreme Court in charge of everything. It was the three branches fighting it out and keeping each other in line. And I guess that is a theme that runs through the book because we see many instances in our constitutional history where the real important constitutional interpretations, the things that made a difference, came from political actors, actions of Congress, actions of presidents. We have a whole chapter on Lincoln and the Civil War and the constitutional crisis there. And a lot of that was reacting actually against things that the Supreme Court had decided. The infamous Dred Scott decision of 1857 on uh, which the Supreme Court said that Congress could not prohibit the extension of slavery and that blacks had no rights, whether citizens, w whether slaves or free. Um, the civil, that was actually a large precipitating event leading to the chain of events culminating in the Civil War. And so that not every judicial decision actually became the last word on the Constitution. The last word on the meaning of the Constitution with respect to slavery came from we the people by adopting a constitutional amendment. And the last word on the issues of secession and civil war uh, wasn't decided in any court, it was decided on the battlefields uh, of the Civil War. So we, we trace a lot through the book uh, the various decisions of various constitutional actors in interpreting the Constitution and sort of take on, as gently as we can, this sort of myth of judicial supremacy that whatever the Supreme Court says establishes the rule for everybody. I talked long enough. Did I leave anything for you to add? Yeah, it? you did. Okay. <laughs> because there's more yet to the story of Marbury versus Madison. It actually came out against the Supreme Court in some sense, hmm. because this was, um, this was President Jefferson who, was, who had failed, whose administration had failed to deliver the commission for, what position was it? Justice of the Peace or it was, something? It was just a Justice of the Peace for the District of Columbia. Yeah. And so President Jefferson, actually his uh, Secretary of State? Mm -hmm. No. Yes. yes. Secretary of State, James Madison was being sued uh, for Mar Mr. Marbury's commission. And so the Jefferson administration was putting a lot of political pressure on the court, which was politically opposed to him, to not deliver the commission. And the Supreme Court ended up agreeing. It found, using this method of judicial review, that it did not have the power that Congress had granted it to decide this kind of case. So it's another example of tension between the branches, each branch with its own constitutional interpretation. And it's not necessarily that the Supreme Court won, it's just a, a balance of power between the president and Congress that had made this law and the courts. And, and ironically, Marbury versus Madison, far from being an assertion of judicial supremacy, 
what was kind of an act of judicial restraint. They held against their own authority, saying that the, that the, the suit, for, that the idea that the Supreme Court could award this commission to Marbury violated limitations on its own jurisdiction. You have a, a as you mentioned uh, in passing just now, you have a wonderfully rich discussion of Abraham Lincoln and, and the Civil War and, and its central importance in our uh, constitutional understanding. What, what were the key decisions that Lincoln made that most contributed to his legacy as a constitutional figure? Mm. Oh, I could go on and talk about Abraham Lincoln for a whole hour. Will you stop me if I, if I get to, or, or, this is the way it often worked, is I would go on and on and Luke would say, that's enough. <laughs> These are the key points. So channeling my best Luke restraint on his dad. The, the key points are that Lincoln was actually an anti-slavery moderate. The Constitution protected slavery in certain ways, and he didn't deny what the Constitution actually said. But he drew the line at the authority of Congress to prohibit the extension of slavery into new territories. You know, that was the big issue in the 1850s was the Wilmot Proviso, the Compromise of 1850, Kansas-Nebraska Act. And Lincoln's stance was that Congress had the power to prohibit the extension of slavery into the territories because it wasn't forbidden to them by the Constitution. The Supreme Court struck down that view in the Dred Scott decision in 1857 and said slavery was a national constitutional right that the federal government couldn't limit uh, in the territories. And Lincoln sort of rose to prominence as a critic of the Supreme Court. So that when he was elected president, the South seceded in part on the theory that we've just elected, oh, you've just elected, this anti-constitutional, anti-Supreme Court precedent, see ya, we're leaving. Right? Um, Lincoln's first inaugural address is, is actually a brilliant lawyer's brief for the correctness of his position on slavery, you know, how, how, how it was really faithful to what the Constitution actually said. The unconstitutionality of secession, the permanence of the Union and the supremacy of the Constitution under, that, uh, under the Union and the obligation of the president to resist secession on the grounds that it was the executive's responsibility to pass on the government as it had been and to faithfully execute the laws throughout the whole of the nation. So Lincoln really stuck to his position that led to the Civil War out of a consequence of his adherence to what he thought the Constitution said and his strong sense of moral and political obligation to enforce the Constitution exactly as written. So the, it's really not much of an exaggeration, Michael, to say that the, the Civil War was fought over questions of constitutional meaning and constitutional interpretation. Did I leave anything? Yes, you did. OK, good. <laughs> so that was the first thing I had in mind, was sticking to the Constitution defending the Constitution as against the Supreme Court's Dred Scott decision. Then the other major thing that we talk about in that chapter of the book is Lincoln's use of war powers and presidential powers. Uh, and I think the best example of that would be the Emancipation Proclamation, which is uh, the 1863, I think, proclamation that it was a military order. It said, the Union armies will liberate slaves uh, as, as captured enemy property, essentially, which was a legitimate use of the war power. And that was controversial at the time. Like, can, can the president even do that? But that's what really killed slavery. That's what made it impossible to go back. Yeah. It <clears throat> if the professor can elaborate. Uh, it, it is really interesting. Lincoln did not think he had constitutional authority just to abolish slavery in the states. That would be the president making a law. But he thought he had authority as commander in chief of military in time of war to take military measures to subdue and overwhelm an enemy force or power. 
And part of the traditional law of war, as Luke explained, was you, you could free and convert the enemy's slaves into your resources. So Lincoln's theory of the Emancipation Proclamation was a constitutional theory that the president's military power permitted him to seize enemy resources and convert it to Union advantage by permanently freeing the slaves. And as I think many of you know, he could not free slaves in the slave states that remained in the Union. And even in areas of the Confederacy uh, that were not under, uh, that, that had come under Union control, it was always a measure you would take to conquer enemy resources. And it, it's part of why, uh, probably some of you have seen the, the movie Lincoln, okay? And he's worried near the end of the war about whether the Emancipation Proclamation will continue to have legal force once the fighting has stopped. So that's why he pushes so hard for the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which is what really puts the, the nail in the coffin of slavery. Uh, if the Emancipation Proclamation killed slavery, it's the 13th Amendment which abolishes it and puts that prohibition right there in the text of the Constitution that really puts the last nails in the coffin of slavery. So, so as, as you can tell, we get really enthusiastic about the constitutional issues surrounding the Civil War. And the interesting thing is th those weren't decisions reached by any court. They were decisions reached by presidents and congresses and fought over in, in the battlefields. One of the best chapters in, in the book is, is filled with interesting uh, discussion of uh, constitutional text and history. Chapter eight is on uh, kind of a forgotten or maybe sometimes neglected period of constitutional history running from about Reconstruction, 1876 or so, through the New Deal. And you pull together uh, a set of Supreme Court cases and constitutional doctrines that period that were actually really bad, <laughs> were really bad development in American history. Uh, and I think, I think it's one of the mo most interesting parts of the book. So. Um. That's chapter eight. We, we give these chapters one word titles. And it's really hard to reduce whole periods of time to one, one word theme. But the period that we, the word we used for that period was betrayal. Because it seemed that after the victories of the Civil War, a lot of the decisions of the Supreme Court from 1876 to about 1936, a broad five, six decade period, seemed to slide back from the gains that had been made in the Constitution. And it was a period in which the Supreme Court held that women did not have equal constitutional rights under the Constitution. It denied, it, one of the cases we, we really rail against is a case called Bradwell versus Illinois, which was a case involving um, an Illinois rule that forbade women, or at least married women, from becoming lawyers. I, I see some people shaking their heads in, in disgust here. We're, we're totally with you on that. The Supreme Court uh, completely failed to address the fact that uh, the equal protection of the laws means that you can't make a distinction that's explicitly based on categories of people. Now, what misled them a lot, and you see this throughout this period of history, was that they confused their own social understandings of good policy with what the Constitution must say. And the thing is, the Constitution sometimes says things that are different with our from our present cultural understanding of what would be good policy. And so instead, they wrote their policy into the Constitution uh, saying that the office of wife and mother was the duty of a woman and it was inappropriate for women under the laws of God and nature to, to be a lawyer. I hope my daughter isn't listening. No, I hope she is and takes the lesson that the Supreme Court sometimes just gets it flatly wrong. Then there's a series of other decisions. Plessy versus Ferguson, the decision upholding separate but equal segregation came in this era. Uh, a case called Lochner versus New York was a, probably one of the most judicially activist decisions striking down regulatory and economic policies on the grounds that there was a sort of right to property and right to contract. Pure judicial activism. People talk about judicial activism today 
But it's interesting to go back 100 years and see that this is a phenomenon that is just recurrent in the court's history, where they, they take their own views of what would be good and right and pure and just, and then try to bend, fold, spindle, and mutilate the Constitution to, to get them to reach that result. And there, there, there are many others, uh, but this was, this was a period of the Constitution that is often ignored in the history books and in the, in the law school textbooks as if nothing happened for 60 years. Well, plenty happened. It's just sort of embarrassing stuff that happened during this time. Well, once again, you, you did leave something for me. Good. Um, the, the one that I, I had in mind was um, Buck v. Bell, which is uh, eugenics. Like the very best science of that day and age, but the court upheld the forced sterilization of the mentally ill. And Oliver Wendell Holmes, who is this famous and very learned and mostly well, do we say mostly great, or? Well, we, we have disagreements as to whether Holmes was a great justice or not. A very famous justice, at any rate. <laughs> <laughs> writes this disgusting opinion. And there's, it completely fails to apply. It, it was the equal protection of the laws, right, that was at stake. Yes, yes, he, he, he was saying, well, this is sort of the last refuge of constitutional scoundrels. Everybody makes these arguments based on equal protection. He sort of gave it the back of his hand. Holmes was also not very good on First Amendment freedom of speech. Um, there are many cases from that era in which the Supreme Court upheld the suppression of anti-war speech. That's actually the origins of Holmes's famous clear and present danger test. You might have heard that. And the idea of you know, uh, not shouting fire in a crowded theater. Um, and he used these sort of phrases. He was a wonderfully gifted writer, but he used these sonorous phrases to reach results that actually were contrary to the Constitution's protections of free, uh, free speech. So I, I tend to think he's very much overrated, but that's easy to say from a vantage point of 100 years later. <laughs> you, you also, uh, at various points in the book, talk about the recurring question of national and state power. And if I read you rightly, you have a sympathy with the sort of Alexander Hamilton inspired national authority as, as part of our constitutional text and structure. Um, yes. Um, so our general position is that, well, I guess this requires a bit of historical background. So the reason for the adoption of the Constitution is the complete failure of the previous system of government for the United States, the Articles of Confederation, which did give each individual state clear sovereign power. And it operated more along the lines of a treaty or a United Nations, where the federal government had the authority to ask states for money, for example, or for troops for the armed forces. But the states were under no obligation, really, to give it. And any changes required the approval of all 13 states at the time. So the Constitution was in large part designed to produce a strong federal government that actually could hold the Union together and govern effectively. And to that end, they gave the government substantial powers. Now, they were very careful to limit those powers to specific areas, the regulation of commerce, the armed forces, and so forth. But they are still very broad powers. And the Constitution doesn't really provide any reason to interpret them otherwise. Now, the Constitution does still guarantee a level of state sovereignty, that states are sovereign over all areas in which the Constitution doesn't give power to the federal government. And that's where a lot of the controversy arises. But our take generally is that we should interpret the Constitution's grants of power generously. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I think that's right. When it, 
as, as the Constitution is immediately being implemented, Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, who was Washington's Secretary of Treasury, adopted a broad view of national powers. And James Madison, one of his collaborators in writing the Federalist Papers, adopted a narrower view of uh, constitutional powers. And, and Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson also opposed broad national powers. So what we find interesting is a lot of today's debates over the scope of national powers are actually replays of Alexander Hamilton versus Thomas Jefferson transposed and fast forwarded some 225 years. Um, we generally side with the Hamilton view, not because we're politically disposed to broad national powers, but really because that's what we think the Constitution actually says. And that's kind of a, a, question, a point we were talking about just before coming out here is the Constitution doesn't map well onto any particular political agenda that actually faithful interpretation of the Constitution will sometimes produce politically liberal results, and sometimes it'll produce politically conservative results. And the framers in drafting the Constitution set out a broad charter of government and didn't have today's politics specifically in mind. And actually, we, we, find that, we found as we were writing that, the book that it, it turned out to be in some ways non-ideological or sort of mixed ideological in that, uh, that the, the way different controversies come out in different generations uh, doesn't necessarily reflect any particular political view today. You'll see a lot of people invoking the Constitution for political purposes today, but I would urge you that if the Constitution always agrees with your politics, you're probably not reading the Constitution. You're probably reading your politics into the Constitution. Because I, I, that's, so there are sometimes we, we've gotten some criticism from reviewers, well, or disagreement. Most people actually like the book, but they disagree with particular points, and some of that disagreement comes from the political left, and some of the disagreement comes from the political right, which thinks, leads us to think that we're probably hitting the middle and probably hitting it just right. Well, let's turn to some questions from the audience uh, in this last 20 minutes or so of our time together. Here's an interesting question. Are legal scholars 100 years hence as likely to question today's rulings as you question the past rulings? Oh, what a terrific question. Do you want to handle that? Go ahead. <clears throat> um, you're, you're the legal scholar. Oh. <laughs> <clears throat> Actually, that, that, the reason that's so insightful is, you know, we sit here as Monday morning quarterbacks looking back on things 100 years ago, 150 years ago, and we go, you know, we're, we're hitting ourselves in the head. Like, how could they have thought that? And it seemed that people were pretty convinced that those were the proper constitutional understanding of the time. I am convinced that 50, 100 years from now, 10 years from now, people will look back at some of what passes for constitutional interpretation today and go, what were they thinking? Of course, I mean, if you have a broad historical sense of looking at the way subsequent generations have viewed previous generations' constitutional interpretations, I, I think you have to, 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 to come to the conclusion that there's a lot that, uh, to be skeptical about today and that might not survive 30, 40, 50 years from now. The, the last chapter of the book uh, covers the most recent constitutional period. It's 1960 to 2015. It's a ridiculous period of time to try to cover in one cap uh, to capture in, in one chapter. But the, the one word title we use for that is controversy because the theme of the modern era has been sort of a resurgence of judicial activism where courts decide more and more issues of social and governmental policy. And in many ways, I, I think it's entirely possible that uh, when, when Luke's up here 40 years from now having this conversation with my grandson, if, <laughs> when they're doing the third edition of the book or something, <clears throat> It, it could, the constitutional world could look different, and we could look back on the late 20th century as a period that's constitutionally questionable. It's certainly much debated, right? Everything in the, the Supreme Court decides these days is a hot topic debate. And you know, I, I think it's very plausible that we'll view the issues of today as uh, ones in which constitutional interpretation might, in certain circumstances, have gone awry. Do, do you agree? Yes, 
partly, I think, controversy is a little bit of a cop-out. Because every, every generation has, has it, had its big controversies. And the difference with the modern era is just we're, we're a little more careful about not taking a position on it because we, we aren't sure where it's going. Mm -hmm. A few questions about specific provisions. I'll just uh, go, go through a few of them if we, have, if we have time. Was the Second Amendment essentially based on the founders' fears of standing armies? Uh, yes. Uh, Next. I don't, well, <laughs> well I, let, me, let me try and give the short version. The Second Amendment is a fascinating amendment. The political purpose of it was fear of a central national army, and they wanted to protect the people's right to bear arms and keep and bear arms, in part as a military check on a national military, something that from our modern standpoint we view as wildly anachronistic. But the idea was, we, f we fear the possibility of a national government holding all the guns the same way we would view the British having all the guns. So what they're thinking in protecting the right to keep and bear arms is Minutemen who can be summoned on a moment's notice to resist an overweening national government. Now that's probably the purpose and the historical background. But it's interesting the way they wrote the text of the Second Amendment. They talked about the importance of a militia, and they gave that as sort of a little preamble and sort of an introductory phrase. But then the content of the right is the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So it's an interesting example that the content of the right that they wrote is actually broader than the historical purposes that led to it. And this produces some fascinating debates. The Supreme Court has been divided very, very closely on these issues. And you have one camp that says, this clause, this amendment is only about state militias and it's a dead letter and it doesn't apply to individual handgun ownership. And another camp, and this is the, the one that has narrowly prevailed at the Supreme Court in recent years, is that well, look at what they actually wrote. The content of the right they wrote, like it or not, provides an individual right to personal firearms possession. And the Supreme Court is just now uh, really working out the understandings of an amendment adopted in 1791. So it, it did have these historical purposes, but when they write a constitutional text, they write it to survive um, and endure over time, and the nature of the right they wrote was one that has broad implications for today that go beyond their specific contemplation at the time. Another question about a, a specific provision of the Constitution. Please discuss the Founders' intent regarding the Commerce Clause and the use and abuse of the Commerce Clause over the years. <laughs> Would you like that one, About hot half potato? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I can give a little bit of background, I guess. So the, the Commerce Clause grants Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and between states. And the, the first major controversy over this is the National Bank. Right. So this was very early on and continued until the era of Andrew Jackson. Yes. Um, was the question of whether Congress has the authority to create a Bank of the United States, um, which today kind of exists as the Federal Reserve. Um, but the question is, is that really a regulation of commerce? It doesn't do anything to directly regulate commerce. But then you have the Necessary and Proper Clause, which says, OK, Congress can make any law that is necessary and proper to carry out these powers that it's given, including the commerce power. And this was another. Hamilton versus Jefferson debate about, OK, what exactly does necessary and proper mean? Does that just mean anything that's strictly necessary? Or does that more broadly mean anything that reasonably serves the ends of, for example, regulating commerce? And it took a while, but Hamilton's view won out. Yeah, today the, the commerce clause, the power to regulate commerce, when when you team it up with the necessary and proper clause, 
sort of becomes the authority that's used to justify most federal government regulations of businesses, economics, and commercial matters generally. Um, I, I had a law professor in, in, in law school who used to tell the story, the punchline of which is the Commerce Clause is something that we use for everything. You know, that it's ironic that a power, and, but I think the words actually sustain this when you get the necessary and proper clause. But the, that a power that was designed primarily to regulate interstate relationships of commerce actually became something that Congress could leverage into a general economic policy argument when they concluded that regulating intrastate within a state matters was necessary to accomplish an interstate commercial regulatory regime. Um, and there hasn't been a case that struck down a statute, Congress, exercising the commerce power since, oops, 2012. I think it is the Obamacare case was one where they actually the Supreme Court said, you know, imposing a mandate to purchase health insurance is not a regulation of commerce, it's a mandate of commerce, and you can't get there under the Commerce Clause. And the ground on which the Supreme Court sustained Congress's power to pass the Obamacare legislation was the taxing power, because they inform what happened under the Obamacare is if you didn't purchase individual health insurance, you were subject to a tax penalty. And so it was a taxing power, another power that Hamilton and Madison debated furiously, uh, that became the basis for sustaining the uh, Patient Protection Affordable Care Act uh, just a few years ago. So it's, it's interesting. The, the, the arguments in 2012 are the same arguments as in 1789. They're just translated into different contexts and different characters. And, and in 1930, like that's the other big era of Commerce Clause dispute is the New Deal. And my, my, this is my favorite example of like how far can you stretch the Commerce Clause power is, okay, a, a farmer somewhere in the Midwest is producing wheat on his farm that he's consuming himself or using to feed his cattle or something. And New Deal era agriculture regulations say, no, we're gonna limit the amount of wheat you can actually produce. Uh, because that affects market prices. And they say, well, producing wheat for one's own consumption also affects market prices. So it's a very tenuous connection to commerce in any normal understanding of the term. But they did uphold it. They did uphold it. A famous case called Wickard versus Filburn, about farmer Farmer Filburn in Ohio, who was growing wheat on his own land, and he said, you can't regulate that. And the Supreme Court said, I think it was unanimously. Really? Yes, we can. <laughs> A few questions about the founder's intent. Uh, so I was kind of going to read one, which represents several others. <clears throat> Many writers profess to understand the founder's intent of the Constitution, but the founders were a very diverse bunch, Federalists and Anti-Federalists, et cetera. Is there anything such as the original founder's intent to guide us? Wow, oh, that's a great question and a debate over the, for the ages. Um, actually, let me take a slightly different take on it. The, there were many different purposes, many different intentions, and people came together, and that's the reason why the debate culminates in a written text. One of the points we make early on in describing the Constitution as its central feature, you know, one of its core uh, pillars, is the fact that it is a written constitution, which you know, we're very familiar with it, right? We see the document itself and read the parchment and look at it under glass at the National Archives or a copy of the Bill of Rights here. But at the time, this was regarded as an innovation. Usually the term constitution referred to a nation's governing practices. The American understanding of constitution is we wrote it down. Right? What we have is an authoritative written text which declares itself to be supreme law of the land. Now the framers did not think that their private expectations or the subjective intentions were what counted. What counted were the words they wrote down on paper and the meaning of those words. Now a lot of that is obviously affected by your understanding of history and the social context in which it was written. 
But one of the leading debates these days is whether the Constitution is interpreted as in accordance with the original meaning of its words, or should it be the subjective intentions of its authors? Or another uh, variation is some people argue that the meaning of the Constitution evolves over time. We tend to lean against the idea that the meaning of the words evolves fluidly. Um, rather, the meaning of the words sometimes was a broad meaning that permits different generations to adopt different policies through democratic governance, all consistent with the Constitution. Um, so, the, but, but that's, a, that's a debate we sort of introduce and sketch out. The, the various approaches to constitutional interpretation. There probably is no single framer's intent or founding father's intention, but there is a single document, right? And actually, and that's the enterprise is to read the, and understand the meaning of the words of the document, understand the context in which they're written, and the, the, the ways in which they apply to different problems over different periods of time. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, and we have a question that asks, what influence did Magna Carta have on the US Constitution? Well, that, that's yours, because I think you wrote that section. I think I wrote yeah. that page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it literally is a page. We have these uh, pull-out sections in the book that describe usually people who were important in the Constitution's history. But one of them is talking about the Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights, which are sort of the exceptions to what you just described, that in England, for example, had an unwritten constitution. Its constitution was just the way things were done, the established tradition of government practices and the precedents that its courts had handed down. But Magna Carta was specifically the rights of the people against the monarchy. And the English Bill of Rights was similar. And they were important influences for the Constitution and also for the state constitutions. And before that, I suppose the colonial charters that were written that sort of provided the basis for the Constitution. The Constitution was not the first written Constitution. It was adopting innovations from the states in the years before, the years of the American Revolution. I, I have nothing to add. <laughs> we don't have a lot of time remaining, but this, this is a, a rich and interesting question, which uh, may, may be a nice way to, uh, to, to close out. Do you believe the people have the ability to understand the Constitution and are capable of making legitimate constitutional arguments? If so, by what method are the people able to exert their interpretation of the Constitution? How are the people able to exercise their popular sovereignty? A lot, a lot of parts to the question, but an interesting question about what role do we, the people, have in exercising our popular sovereignty in the Constitution? This is a great question to end on. <laughs> this is one of the things that I feel really strongly about relating to this book. And I think, in the end, it's one of the reasons for us writing the book, is to show anybody, the, the average citizen, that yes, what we think about the Constitution, the way we debate about the Constitution, does matter. And part of that is pushing back against the trend in this latest era, say starting with 1960, to consider the Supreme Court as the only uh, branch of government that can interpret the Constitution in a way that binds all the other branches. And that's historically, I think what we're trying to show is that's not really accurate. The President and Congress and sometimes even the states have played an important role in constitutional interpretation. And of course, those are democratically elected, directly elected branches of government. So really, what popular sovereignty and constitutional interpretation means is that people care about what's being done with the Constitution, and that comes out in elections. 
And so the, the basic message of this book, or one of them, I mean, I'm sure there are many, and we're trying to educate too, but the basic message is that people can and should care about what the Constitution means and what it is. Uh, that, that's terrific. If, if the professor can add just a <laughs> word or two. Um, in, in part, we want to demystify the Constitution. We don't think that the Constitution is a mystical, mysterious document with obscure meanings that only lawyers educated at Harvard, Yale, and Stanford can understand and that they then proclaim it to the rest of us. We, we think that the meaning of the Constitution's provisions, written in plain English, were written for popular understanding and popular application. You know, the first three words, right? It's almost a cliche, we the people. You know, the Constitution was designed as a people's document establishing the fundamental law that governs the governors, right? And that the people were responsible and that the ultimate interpreters of the Constitution are we the people, that it's a document designed for us and our posterity. I think those are the closing words of the preamble. So that, that's exactly right, as part of what we wanted to do was write a book not just for lawyers or professors, but write a book for the people uh, that would reintroduce the people to their constitution and equip citizens um, of all different types uh, for engagement on constitutional issues. Um, and, and that's what we're hoping we've accomplished here. The Constitution, an introduction by Michael Stokes Paulson and Luke Paulson. Congratulations on writing the book and publishing it. It is a fantastic book. Everyone should read it, as we just heard, uh, if you want to be an engaged and informed citizen under the Constitution. Thank you both, and this has been a delightful event, and I believe there will afterward be books available for purchase and signing by the authors. Thank you, Michael and Luke. Thank you.